Hey everybody, welcome to the Sweet Georgia channel and to the Taking Back Friday live stream. I am <clears throat> Felicia from Sweet Georgia, which is a hand dyed yarn company based here in Vancouver in Canada. And also we have an online fiber arts school called the School of Sweet Georgia, where we teach everything from knitting to spinning to weaving to dyeing. We do these live streams every month, the second Friday of every month, and it just gives us a chance to catch up about what's been happening inside the studio, what's happening at the school. And uh, I get to talk a little bit about my experiences of being this multi-craftual maker or this person who enjoys more than one craft at a time. And so last month, we talked a lot about time blocking or literally carving out chunks of time in your weekly schedule to make time for making things. And now today we're gonna talk about we're going to talk very, very in depth about this uh, documentation system that I have created for my multi craftual life. Yes, documentation. It doesn't sound that exciting, but it's really exciting to me. I'm really excited about this thing that I've built. So I'm going to share that with you. But before we get started with that aspect of it, talking about documentation, things like that, I do want to share with you some of the things that we have just come out with at the studio. So as you know, we make hand dyed yarn. As you know, we have an amazing team of people at the studio who do a lot of this dyeing. They do the production dyeing every every single day. There is stuff being dyed. Um, and in the process of dyeing all of the yarn with the colorways that we normally make at Sweet Georgia, these dyers have become inspired over the past, I don't know how long. Um, and so we are creating this thing that's called the Stitch Diaries, which is a collaboration between the dyers at the studio. It gives them an opportunity to create their own colorways, design their own things. And then we work together with Tabitha Hedrick, who is our design director, and she creates um, combinations of stitch patterns and she creates designs using the colorways that have been dyed by the dyers. So this season, the Stitch Diaries season three has been dyed by Kathy, Kathy Tai. Uh, you might see their photos in many of our uh, model photo shots and things like that on our website. So Kathy has also been doing a lot of video editing for us. And she is also um, one of the camera operators when we do our filming for the School of Sweet Georgia. So Kathy is doing a lot of different things. She's dyeing and she's doing video production <laughs> she's helping with the school and so she's modeling it's it's been um it's been wonderful so the the colorway that kathy created for the season three stitch diaries is called hillside splendor so i want to show that to you this is the colorway that they made um it is a hand dyed gradient sock blank so i'm going to show you what these season three stitch diaries looks like it comes in a little box like this the little kit box you open it up and inside oh the instructions are there and inside there are two items one of them is the sock blank this is the one that kathy created and designed it's very lovely and it gets paired with another skein here. This one happens to be in the Cayenne colorway. And this one is a Tough Love Sock. Uh, the sock blank, the base yarn is also Tough Love Sock. And so these two combined together makes this scarf sample. So this scarf has the cayenne mixed and blended on both sides, actually. There's a really interesting edging here with a bit of the contrast from the cayenne. Looks really, really, really cool. But you can see that, well, maybe hopefully you can see that the stitch patterns in this scarf are, you know, very straightforward, should be very easy to do. The idea is that it's a combination of knits and pearls. And so this instruction book comes with it. And um, in here, Tabitha has created a combination of patterns that she's calling subtle patterns. So they are all combinations of knits and pearls. So you can see that is what they kind of look like. There's a stitch pattern and then the instructions for doing the stitch pattern. And then you can combine these in sort of any any combination that you want um, to produce something similar to this. If you wanted to knit this exact thing, you could, or you can mix and combine and make your own sort of scarf with these two different colors. But I do love this gradient. It's called Hillside Splendor. It's just beautiful, like this grassy green 
and then there's kind of like fields of gold sort of color here it's really really lovely so kathy's done a beautiful job of creating this colorway and i i do love how it's been combined with this cayenne it looks really really great together so wonderful job kathy and tabitha on this beautiful stitch diaries and so these ones are sort of limited we make them for a certain amount of time and then they're no longer available so if you do want one they are available on the website right now it's um sweetgeorgiayarns.com slash shop slash stitch diaries season three so hopefully you guys can find that there if you are wanting to make a beautiful scarf with the sock blank and a second skein you can make anything you want from those now, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, we have been releasing lots of new courses this year on the School of Sweet Georgia. Most recently, we've released a class about spinning with silk fiber. So if you've never spun with silk before, Rachel Smith from Welford Pearls, she's also a woolen spinning, she has taught this massive course with us about spinning luxury fiber. And so the first installment of this spinning luxury fiber course is spinning silk. So it's everything from spinning Tassa silk, spinning Bombic silk, spinning airy silk, peduncle. Um, I think there was one more that I can't remember. Um, but there's a bunch of different kinds of silks because silk has all different textures. It has all different uh, characteristics. And so she really leads you through the process of understanding what are the different characteristics of these different kinds of silks and how would you spin them. So oh, Greta has very kindly posted a link to the silk course in the school. So that is there. Another course that's coming out that has been very, very um, uh, people are very, very excited about this, but it's a course about e-spinning. And so uh, how do you use an e-spinner to spin yarn? And this one is being taught by uh, Debbie Held. And so we filmed this last year, last April. Very excited to finally be able to release it. If you uh, want to see a little bit of footage from the class, we did make a little comparison video showing the different kinds of e-spinners that we worked with. And so that is available on YouTube. We can maybe post a link to that later. Um, but Debbie basically spins on I think five different e-spinners and we compare sound we compare size compare a lot of different things so the e-spinner class in full is coming out very very shortly and then the next thing that is coming out is uh, in April we are going to show a new course by Charlotte Lee who is our assistant production manager here at the school and um, at the at Sweet Georgia and she has been a long, long, long time crochet aficionado. And so she developed a course that is all about granny squares. And so granny squares, like foundational, the foundation of so much uh, crochet uh, projects and things like that. So she took a granny square and made it into four different projects. I think it's four or five different projects. This is one of the projects that you could make if you learned to make a granny square. This is such a cute little pillow cover and each one of these is a granny square. She shows you how to join them all together. Um, you could do something like this or you could do something like this. Something completely different even though they are the same pattern, just using different colors. You can get completely different effects. So there's a lot of different things that you could do with this multiple color combinations. These ones happen to be from a similar palette. So there's blues and greens and golds in here, but you could make it rainbow. You could make it whatever you want. Um, and then this one using a lot of white or like neutral, empty uh, sort of space, white space to help with the design. So there's these two projects. There's also course a crochet granny square blanket for well it could be for babies or you could use it as a lap blanket while you watch tv this is really lovely starting out from the center and then just working this beautiful big granny square that's fun or a different color combination here so this is working with the gradients like one at a time so big chunks of color this is colors fading in and out. Again, these are all, I believe, five colors, five skeins of Superwash DK, our Sweet Georgia Superwash DK. And so these two projects are also described in the upcoming Granny Square course. So really, really excited about that. Charlotte's got me interested in crocheting and I got myself a little set of crochet hooks, so I'm gonna give that a try. 
yeah, lots of things to work on. <laughs> Yes, I love all the projects. I was really excited to be able to show you the Granny Square ones because those have been sitting in the studio here waiting to be shown. Um, they're excited about that. So let's talk about documentation systems now. <laughs> Especially since if you're going to be making some things with crochet, you're going to be dyeing some things, you're going to be knitting some things, weaving things, spinning things, how are you going to keep track of all of your notes about all of these things? And so I do want to talk about this very, very specific custom made documentation system that I created. I made it for me. Um, and so I hope that maybe you'll find some aspects of it that you might find interesting, that you might find helpful, and maybe you'll adopt them into your own systems. So when I was starting to try to pull all this together, I just, I don't know about you, but I have found that there's no one size fits all solution for tracking and managing craft projects across all the different kinds of crafts. So I know that there's a lot of knitters or crocheters will use Ravelry to track their projects. You can track your inspiration in there. You can track your progress. You can track finished projects. Um, but as you know, I also weave. I also spin. I also machine knit. I also machine knit on both the flatbed and the circular machines. And I found it kind of interesting that if you need to track the details of machine knitting projects on a CSM, like on a circular sock knitting machine, those notes are going to be different than if you're knitting things on a flatbed knitting machine. So even though they're technically both machine knitting, they're still different. And the details that we need to track for each of these things, they're different as well. So about a year ago, I think I maybe did a little segment on one of the live office hours for the school where I showed a peek into my system that I created for tracking my weaving projects because I was doing a lot of weaving. I was weaving samples for the school. I was weaving things that were just personally interesting to me and I was weaving things that were going to be um, submissions for the Guild of Canadian Weavers uh, program. And so I needed to track all of the different things that I was working on. Now, I've kind of used the foundation of that idea and I've completely started from scratch and developed a system for tracking more than weaving projects. So now it tracks everything that I want to make and do, everything from ideas that I found on Pinterest to completed projects and all the details of everything. So I know that this episode is not going to be for everyone. And I have talked about this before, but some people are very, very much going to prefer working with an analog way of tracking projects. So using a notebook, using a bullet journal, keeping like sheets of paper in binders, keeping physical samples, all of that stuff. Definitely some people, some makers, some crafters are going to really love that. Um, for me, just the way that I work, I need my documentation system to be accessible to me anywhere and at any time. So that means that it really needs to live in the cloud in the internet because I need to be able to look things up and add information from my cell phone, from my mobile device, from my laptop, from my studio. When I'm at home, I need to add things when I'm in the attic. If I'm traveling, I just, I need that information at hand all the time. Um, yeah, like Vicky said, very, very digital. We've talked about digital storage uh, ideas as well. Um, so I cannot wait always to get home to my desk to put the notes into everything because I will have forgotten it by that time. So that's why my documentation system <clears throat> has to be very digital. Um, and I know that if I put it all into a notebook, I'm going to lose the notebook or I'm going to forget it when I need to use it. <laughs> so it's just not practical for me to have everything analog. So I'm going to be talking about this online cloud-based software called ClickUp that we have used to build this entire documentation system. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Now, we'll talk about why do I need this documentation system? And it is because I cannot remember everything. I have trouble remembering anything these days. Um, I don't know about you, but I think that when you have like a lot of things going on and you have, you know, things that you have to remember for your husband, things that you have to remember for your kids, things that you have to remember for all the activities, things that you have to remember for work, things you have to remember for personal. There's just so many things to remember. I cannot remember everything. So I need to write everything down in a place where I can um, reference it, a place that is a trusted space, somewhere where I know the details are going to be when I need to find them. Um, it can't be like 
somewhere in the digital ether, like somewhere in some Google Notes or somewhere in some Apple Notes or Evernote or whatever. I need them in one place where I know they're all going to be. The second thing is that teaching and designing things requires very detailed and very accurate notes um, and records. And I have found out all of this the hard way. <laughs> you know, like after having created a number of these weaving classes for the School of Sweet Georgia, we make projects that go along with them. And um, always my struggle, I feel like this is a struggle of other people as well. My struggle is that when I come down to write the pattern that needs to go with the course or whatever, I will have forgotten things like what EPI was that? How many ends did I get? What was the measurement on the loom? And if you don't know the measurements on the loom, off the loom, and after finishing, then you have challenges trying to figure out how much was your shrinkage? How do you put all those things into your pattern so that you can share this with other people in a very accurate way? If I'm trying to make something that I'm hoping someone else will be able to replicate, I need to give them as much information as possible. And so I need to track a lot of details. And the way that I used to do it, I, was, I would write them on scraps of paper next to the loom. And then I would lose the scraps of paper. <laughs> it's just, it seems so obvious, but yeah. So that has been very, very challenging. So I know the kinds of notes that I need to take, and I'm just trying to do a better job of taking those notes in the future. So what are the kinds of things that I need to track? I need to track the very specific details of the craft projects. And each of these craft projects is going to be, um, you're going to have to track very specific attributes. So tracking things for knitting is different than tracking information for weaving. It's very different from tracking things for spinning. Um, for weaving, I need to know EPI. I need to know number of ends. I need to know, you know, how many ends did I slay through the reed? What reed did I use? Um, a lot of notes like that. Even for machine knitting, the flatbed machines, I need to know what the tension dial, what was the stitch dial, what was the tension dial. Um, for crochet projects, you want to know like what cro crochet hook did you use? Those are very standard information, but each one of these crafts requires different information. The other thing that I wanted to track is I want to track a backlog of all of my creative ideas, like literally anything that I've ever seen on Pinterest that I'm like, oh, that looks like fun. I might want to make that. And I want to capture it somewhere where I won't lose that. I don't want to capture it in Pinterest because then I have to keep going back to Pinterest. And when I go back to Pinterest, then I get lost. You know, like it's the same thing that happens on Ravelry. When you go into Ravelry to find a pattern, all of a sudden you spend two hours looking at all these other patterns. So I don't want that. I just want when I see it, I want to capture it. And then I want to look at those ideas later on and decide if I'm going to move forward with it. So that's that's what I'm trying to do. Um, I also need it to be more comprehensive than Ravelry because obviously if you're going on Ravelry, you're going to find knitting patterns, you're going to find crochet projects, you're going to find things like that. There's some weaving there, there's some machine knitting, but I'm finding like you could get inspiration anywhere. Somebody's blog post, somebody's Instagram post, I'm collecting everything that I want to like make in the future as just ideas. I don't have to act on them. I just need to hold them. The next thing is I want to maintain a master list of yarn and materials. And this is different than tracking an inventory of stash. I don't necessarily need to know about my stash. Um, and my situation might be different. I feel like because we make yarn, there's always going to be more yarn. <laughs> there's always going to be more yarn, but I need to know what yarn I used. And I want to become an expert at the yarns that I use. So if I use like 10 yarns in all of the different projects that I work with, I want to become very, very knowledgeable about these 10 yarns. How do they work at 10 EPI? How do they work at 12 EPI? What does it feel like in a twill? What does it feel like in a basket weave? What does it feel like if I wet felt it? Like all of these things, I want to know those things so that it can inform future designs, future projects and things like that. So I'm keeping a master list of the yarns that I use, what their gauges are, how they work up at, you know, certain needle sizes or certain machine knitting tension, whatever it is. I'm keeping this kind of information about each one of these yarns. And then I also want to track all of my assets or my equipment, my usage. So I have come to a place where apparently I am fostering um, 
knitting machines and sort of like receiving them, restoring them, repairing them. And I may send them back out into the world, <laughs> but there's a lot of equipment coming and going and things like that. And I want to know if I actually use these machines for making things. If I actually, which looms do I use the most? Which looms do I use the least? Which looms do I never touch? And maybe those ones should be, you know, sent back out into the universe for another weaver to use. So I'm tracking a bit of the usage. I want to have an idea of like, did I acquire it new or used? Um, how long ago have I, did I get it? All of these kinds of little notes and bits and pieces. And I want to track my time. So we had talked last month about blocking out time to actually make things. We've talked about time blocking. And then out of that conversation, um, our team at Sweet Georgia, we kind of went down this path of deciding that we were going to do an experiment and try to see if we could get 15 minutes of crafting time every day for the next 30 days. So we started on February 15th. And so next week, apparently next week, we will have done 30 days of 15 minutes of making every day. And so while I was trying to track that, I was trying to track it in a number of different ways. I got this habit tracker and I was kind of like checking off the days where I got 15 minutes. But like Vicky had mentioned in her, um, she, she, Vicky was also doing this and Vicky was mentioning that, well, I definitely get 15 minutes a day, but I'm curious about what I spent that 15 minutes on. I'm curious about how much time I actually spent because I get often more than 15 minutes. Was it two hours? Was it four hours? Was it 37 minutes? Whatever it is. I decided to start tracking my time related to each different project because I want to know at the end of the day, um, what am I spending my time on? Because I want a better idea, like a more realistic perception of what I'm actually doing with my time. So like we said in the last episode, you know, we're saying, oh, I don't ever have any time to make things. I don't have time. I don't have enough time. And then looking at the schedule and seeing that you can carve out a number of hours every week for making things. Uh, I want to have a realistic understanding of how I actually spend my time with making. What am I actually spending my, which crafts am I spending my time on? So yeah, tracking time for everything. It's a game, game changer. <laughs> and so the last thing is that I built this entire documentation system myself using ClickUp because Ravelry doesn't cover all of the crafts that I do. Uh, Notion is a software product that you could also use for this. Uh, you could definitely use it to build the same kind of documentation system. But I just found with my experience and Tabitha also had a similar experience that as you add more and more information to Notion, it gets very bogged down and um, there was problems with things loading. And it's just, it's just personal experience uh, that, yeah, we struggled with that. Um, you could track a lot of things in Excel or in Google Sheets, but they are just tables of information. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, I also use Evernote. I've been using Evernote since like 2008 or something crazy like that for many, many, many years. And so that stores PDF patterns, knitting patterns, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I've switched to using Obsidian, which is a very DIY kind of software, Obsidian. It's I believe it's free, um, but I've been doing all of my writing in Obsidian. And we basically at work, we live our work life in ClickUp. So we're using it already. It's just there. Um, and so we thought, well, I thought it would be just easy to build it in there because we already use it. So if you've never heard of ClickUp, this is basically their website and their sales information page. You can go have a look at it. This video is absolutely not sponsored <laughs> by ClickUp at all. We just... I love it. I have been using ClickUp since 2018. I love this product. I believe in the CEO. I think that they are on this path to doing great and amazing things. And so that's the only reason why we are like building our entire work life in ClickUp. But I'll just leave that there. Um, so as a rough idea of how I plan this out, you can see here, this is kind of like the structure of how I organized all of my information. These are all of the different crafts that I wanted to track. So there's the CSM knitting, there's knitting, there's crochet, machine knitting, weaving, spinning. I could include lots of other things. I could include punch needle if I wanted to. I could include embroidery. I could imp include sewing, garments, quilting, anything that you want to track, you could put in here as like, these are the projects and crafts that I want to track. 
Um, this is the area for supplies. So I wanted to track this master yarn list. If you wanted, you could also inventory your spinning fiber stash if you wanted to. You could inventory your yarn stash. I did not because um, those things are, yeah, they're less important to me, like the actual physical thing. Um, but you could definitely do that. Uh, equipment, I am tracking things like the knitting machines, I'm tracking the weaving looms and spinning equipment. Uh, this also hopefully would give me an idea of like, did I lend out that e-spinner to somebody? Uh, because <laughs> the, the e-spinners are just so tiny and they go everywhere. So always wondering where they went to. So these are all can be separate tables of information. So you can imagine making a list of all of your projects in Google Sheets and a spreadsheet for all your CSM projects. You could make a table of all the things in your knitting projects and make that into a spreadsheet. But I think that uh, what is really important is um, the fact that there are commonalities between all of these tables of information. There's some information that um, is going to be used over and over again. So things like yarn that you use for a knitting project may be used again for a machine knitting project, may be used again for a weaving project. And so there are sort of these overlaps. And so I want all of this information in a table so that I can sort of easily uh, compare different projects and at a glance I can see things. So this is if you wrote everything in an analog notebook, you wouldn't be able to compare two different kinds of dish towels. But if I have them in a table, I can compare, oh, I wove this dish towel at 18 EPI and I wove that dish towel at 20 EPI. And then I can very quickly understand, oh yeah, this one feels like this, this one feels like that, and making those kinds of connections more rapidly. So I feel like this is, I'm developing my own body of research with this, right? I'm making observations and judgments about the work that I've done by analyzing the the data that I've collected from my own crafting. It sounds really nerdy, I know. Um, now here is the idea that all of these tables are actually related to each other. So if I'm tracking, say, like a machine knitting project, I am referencing yarn that I've used from this master list. I'm also referencing a, a knitting machine that I've used. If I look at like the Tough Love Sock, I can see all of the projects that I've made with Tough Love Sock, whether it's a knitting project or a crochet project or a CSM project or whatever. So all of the projects can be related to the materials that made them up and related to the equipment that was used to make them. So the way that this works into ClickUp is that ClickUp allows me to organize my information into these three levels. There's a level that's called a space um, and that's kind of like this wide overarching umbrella and then there's a folder. So one space can have multiple folders and then inside the folders you can create lists and then on the lists you can put all of your different tasks or individual items. So I created a fresh workspace and uh, made a space that I called craft space. <laughs> you could call this whatever you want. This is not a very exciting title, but I called it craft space for now. And inside I put these three different folders. I've put projects, materials, and equipment. So just like from my previous, um, from my previous sort of diagram. And then in each one of these folders, I made a list and those lists relate to the things that were again in the diagram. So CSM knitting, crochet, machine knitting, knitting, spinning, weaving. These are all lists of different projects that are in the project folder. In the materials folder is the yarn list or the master yarn list, fiber stash if I wanted to track that, and then equipment, lists of machine, uh, knitting machines, um, weaving looms, and spinning equipment. Okay, so those are the kinds of things that I have put into the system that I'm going to be tracking. So let's look first at the yarn list. So this is the master yarn list that I'm using. And these are yarns that I've personally been using over and over again for our projects for either Sweet Georgia or the School of Sweet Georgia. So you can see here, I've tagged, these are all the lists of the names of the yarns. These are all the different suppliers. And so a lot of this information is in a drop down so that I can reuse this information over and over again. Um, I've put in the fiber composition so they can have tags of this is Blueface Lester with silk, this is mohair with nylon, this is cotton with linen, that kind of thing. Um, and then I also have the yarn count here. So that can be also very helpful to um, compare different yarns as well so that you know 
which weights are heavier, which weights are finer, those kinds of things. So this is kind of like the master yarn list. Um, and uh, so you can see here like the some of the Sweet Georgia yarns, BFL and Silk DK, BFL and Silk Fine. Um, there's Merino, no, Mohair Silk Sock, Tough Love Sock, they're all in here. I also use a number of Gist yarns. There's Beam, there's Duet, um, and then Mercerized Cotton from Ashford and Unmercerized Cotton, 8-2 Cotton from Broussard very very common we also use a2 cotton from then which is organic and so all of the projects that i've been making are all from these yarns so this is not complete yet um, but a lot of the times i'm going to be mixing and combining different yarns to create new textures and so i just want to really become an expert at these yarns this next slide here, this is like, say, knitting machines, okay? Uh, so this is tracking all the knitting machines, what their model number is. Um, if I am in the middle of restoring them or if I'm actually using them, I'm tracking machine type. Are they at home or are they at the studio? New, used, uh, when we acquired them. And then here, you can see here, there's a relationship here to the different projects. So you can see that this particular machine has been used in the these three different projects so far and that idea and so as this kind of grows you're going to see more and more and more and more projects that are linked to one particular machine and maybe another machine doesn't have anything linked to it so that's kind of a lot of the information that I'm looking at here uh, you can see here similar idea this is one for looms the looms I can track also manufacturer the loom type the loom width number of shafts um, and uh, again, the relationship to the weaving projects that have been uh, used with that loom. So you can see like even though I'm in this equipment folder and I'm tracking two different kinds of uh, pieces of equipment, they have different attributes. So they like with a knitting machine, I don't have a loom type. I'm not going to track that for a knitting machine, but I'm going to track that for a weaving loom. So this one, we can start to look at the projects now. So the projects in here, uh, this is their uh, ClickUp's list view. And so you can see here, I have set up a number of different statuses. So this particular view shows all of the CSM knitting. These are all the socks that have been knit on the circular sock knitting machine and sort of what state they're at. So some of these socks are like ideas that I have, ideas that I need to make, um, socks that I haven't started yet, or socks that I have yarn for but I haven't started yet, um, socks that are currently in progress, socks that require Kitchener stitch <laughs> and finishing, and then socks that need some like documentation or like uh, just some sort of finalizing beyond beyond actually Kitchener. So those are like the different statuses or the states that a project might be in. And so you can see here the relationship is like with the yarn. These are the different yarns that have been used. And so this is coming from the yarn master list. Um, you can see I'm tracking things like the colorway, number of rows per inch, shoe size, leg length, um, foot rows, I talked about this in last week's video for Taking Back Friday and talked about how I use a chart that I got from Etsy. And so based on the number of rows per inch and the cylinder size that you use, you can just uh, pull a number off of this chart for the number of foot rows to crank. And then the leg rows is actually a calculation. So it's based on what the desired leg length is multiplied by the RPI or the rows per inch. And so that's a calculation column. And then again, this is like a drop down to, to, um, to keep track of the cylinder size that was used for each one of these socks. So yes, I'm going to share with you all of this stuff at the end. There definitely is a link for all of this. Um, so yeah, I think that the key that I want you to see here is that these are very specific CSM details that you need for CSM projects. I don't want any of these fields to appear anywhere in my weaving projects. Um, and so you can see that with every craft, there's going to be some things in common, like using the yarn. Yarn might be in common, but uh, and the status might be in common, but things like rows per inch or shoe size. I don't need shoe size for a weaving project. And so this particular software allows me to customize each one of these lists so that some of the attributes are shared across the different lists and some of the attributes apply only to the list that they are in.
So you can see here, there's another one for machine knitting. So again, the relationship with the yarn being used, I can use multiple yarns. So there's no frills cardigan. I'm using both silk mist and BFL silk held together. So I can track that. I can track which machine's being used. Very important. I have to track which tension dial. Not all of this has been filled in yet. I need time to like convert my notes over from an analog format or from random notes that I've made in my phone. I need to put it all in here so that I know this is the place to go for all of my information. But you can see like there's a lot of room to expand these buttons here with these pluses. I can just add columns. I can add custom fields to describe a machine knitting project. Um, so you can just customize it for whatever it is you need to track. Here right now, this is my knitting projects that are going on. And so you can see here, there's a column here where I can track my time. And so I have the app, there's like, there's a mobile app that you can get on your, your phone and very, very easy. You can just pull up that particular project that you're working on and there's a button, you press the button to start the timer. And then I've been doing this in the evening. So when I start uh, knitting on my, this, this sweater project, <clears throat> I just tap the button and it tracks the time and then I click it off when I'm done and then I'm getting a total for how much time is being used. Now you can, <clears throat> there is a way to kind of like pull all that time tracking information together. So I've created this little dashboard here saying time spent. You can call these things whatever you like. Um, but you can see that out of my knitting, um, I've spent say like four hours and 15 minutes working on this halu sweater and then with the csm knitting i've spent maybe three hours working on toe up socks and then other socks so this is uh this is a way of breaking it down so you could see like oh maybe i spent five hours on weaving this month but i spent five hours weaving on that loom but not that loom or whatever it is this is hopefully all different ways of helping you see what you're doing, how you're spending your time, what are you actually working on? Um, and so all of this is definitely a work in progress is something that I'm working on building out some more. Now, this is a look, one view at the different weaving projects that I'm working on. So, um, Obviously, weaving projects require a lot of very specific, craft-specific information, including your EPI, number of ends, the read use, the number of ends per dent. Um, and so you can see here, this is one of the list views. Uh, you can see these are the relationships. These are the looms that are being used for each one of the projects. Um, this is the yarn that's being used. And then I have a calculation here. So I'm use, looking at how many ends do I have to thread and I personally have calculated before. I've timed myself threading heddles. So I know how many heddles I can thread per minute or per hour. And so I have a calculation here where I take the number of ends and then I kind of figure out how many hours of threading are required for a particular project. So this is just an estimate. It might take longer, it might take less, um, but it just gives me an idea that if I wanted to work on this particular uh, warp, if I wanted to dress the loom, I would have to carve out 2.3 hours of time to sit there and thread heddles. And this is, again, it's just an estimate, but it helps me with my planning. Um, you can also see here, down here in the idea area, at the idea status, this is all the things that I want to make at some point in time. I have no, um, plan for when they are going to happen or when I'm going to do them. I just want to mark down everything that is in my brain that I might want to make at some point in time. And I can come and revisit this later and say, ah, that's not interesting. I'm going to delete that or whatever it is. But I just want a place where I can store all of the ideas. So there could be like 400 ideas on there. That's totally fine. As long as you have time to go through and then review and see, oh, do I actually want to make this or not? So if I do, and then say I collect yarn for it, maybe I've wound a warp for it, then it can go into this plan and prep. If it's actually on the loom, then it goes into this in progress area. And then if I've taken it off the loom and I'm finishing like either wet finishing or doing fringe or fringe twisting or whatever it is, then it goes into the finishing column. And then if I have to write a pattern for it, it goes to like documentation. So that's kind of one look at the weaving projects. This is another view, another way of looking at the same information. So these are the same projects that I showed on the previous slide, but in this view, 
I'm only looking at the measurements. So I've chosen to just show columns for the measurements of each of the projects. So this is some of the detail that I have to track for every project that gets made for the School of Sweet Georgia or for a pattern that we want to design. I have to measure what does it look like on the loom? What's the width and the length on the loom? What's the width and the length off the loom? What is the width and the length after finishing? And then this is a calculation that I've created. These are formulas that take that number and calculate the percentage of shrinkage. So now I know that the next time I make a crackle weave project, when I, when I write a pattern or design something with this crackle weave, with these two yarns at this set or whatever it is, when I go to do my calculations, I know, oh, it's about 8% shrinkage for that particular fabric. So again, this is all data that you're going to use if you're going to make more projects in the future based on things. And it's kind of like, it's this iteration of like making things, learning from what you've made, learning things, and then making the next thing and then learning from that. So it's very, I, I like it. I like seeing the progress of learning from all of this. So in any case, this is the same information, same projects, just a different view. And so you can add all sorts of different views. You can customize these list views. You can just click, well, click on this plus sign here and it says view. You can add another view and then just choose which columns you want to show. So that is that part. Um, you can see up here, I also keep weaving notes in here. So if I wanted to write anything specific about any of these projects, I could pop that in here. So there's a sort of like a documents or a notes function inside this program as well. Um, like I said, there are different ways of viewing the same information. So again, this is the same uh, weaving projects that I was just talking about, but now this is under a board view. So if you guys are familiar at all with Kanban boards, um, they're kind of like columns where you've organized information and you can move them from one status to the next to the next. And so this board view just happens to show them from like the statuses plan and prep, two is in progress, what's been, what's in finishing, what's in documentation and what is complete. And so this is just a nice way of looking at what you've done as well. So these are photos that you can add and then you can pin them and then they become basically thumbnails for each one of these projects. So you can see, oh, right now on the loom, I have a color gamp and crackle weave on the loom. Right now I have to finish these particular things. Right now I have to write up those things. And these ones are the things that are actually finished. And then you can click on this folder for projects and then see everything across all of the different crafts that you're doing. So I can see out of, at a glance, I can see what's in progress right now. It's the color gamp on the loom. It's the crackle weave on the loom. It's also the Studley jumper on the machine and a no frills cardigan on the machine. And I also have a double weave project on another loom. So like, this is just giving me a better picture overall of what am I, what am I working on? Is six projects in progress? Is that too much? <laughs> Might be. Um, so this is kind of where you can just get a glance of what are you working on? What are you doing? Um, and just gives, yeah, this bird's eye view. And I feel like uh, I get all of the information that I need. And it's also really nice to see this complete column. You can hide all of your completed projects if you wanted to but i like seeing the complete projects column because it makes me feel really accomplished it makes me feel really good about the things that i've made so um yeah this is all of the uh, uh things that have been finished and then here these are all of the ideas these are all of the things that are just on my mind i can copy things from Pinterest, put them in here. I can copy things from Ravelry, pop them in here. And then if I want to, then I can just slide them over to the next column and then choose that to start working on them. So that is kind of like a broad overview of the system that I've created. So in conclusion, I am just encouraging you to build your own system using some of these ideas. Um, and of course, there's a few different um, ways of using productivity software for this kind of thing. So like I said, you could use something like Notion. Notion is very, very popular. Um, you could also use ClickUp, which is what I'm using here. There's also Airtable. There's Monday.com. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of software and software continues to change. So there's going to be new software for doing productivity, things like this in the future. Um, so just like 
be open, be flexible, but I love ClickUp and this is what I've been using. Um, the idea here, the fundamental idea here is that you want a relational database where you can track your materials, your equipment, and then link them to your projects. So, I mean, that is what Ravelry is underneath everything. It's a database of all the uh, yarn that's there. It's a database of your personal inventory of stash of, of yarn stash. It's your database of all your projects. And then they're all interrelated. They're linked, but I'm building this myself because I do other crafts and I need more than just knitting projects and crochet projects. I need all of the things. Um, Kristen's asking, does ClickUp allow uploading of PDFs? Yes. So there is a page where I showed, where did I show here? So here is my knitting projects and uh, there's a field where you can upload links of things. And so I happen to upload the link to the PDF pattern of what I'm using so that when I need a pattern, I can just jump in and collect that. Um, and you can, yeah, definitely view PDFs inside ClickUp as well. So that is available. Um, so I have here, if you want to give ClickUp a try, we have sort of like, there's an affiliate link here. You can click on that one. If you want to try my template, you can also try that here. So this link will get you to the template and then you can add it to your own space and customize it, do whatever you like with it. Um, but that is available for you as well. Um, now click up, there is like this free forever option um, and it doesn't give you all of the features. It's like I've been able to make all of these custom fields and have unlimited use of all the custom fields. And so for that, you have to sort of graduate to the unlimited tier, which I believe is $5 a month. Um, it's like $60 for the whole year. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can do with just the free option. So you don't even need to pay for anything. You can just kind of like use it without using all of the custom fields that I've created. But these are just, this is just an idea and this is what I have been doing with all of this. I am very curious to hear about what your system is like. Um, I know this is, this is one of the things that I actually really enjoy doing and looking at and talking about is the system in which you maintain all of your information. Um, for a long time, for I don't know how long ago, I read the book, uh, uh, Getting Things Done by David Allen. And so that book had a lot of impact on me. And one of the ideas around that was this idea of a trusted system, just always putting your information into something that you can rely on and not having your information scattered into like 20 different apps or 20 different, you know, notebooks or whatever it is, 20 different scraps of paper or post-it notes have it all in one place that you go back to over and over and over again. And so for me, that place has become ClickUp and keeping all of my information in there. So um, if your trusted space is like, say, Evernote, you could use that. If it's Notion, you can use that, whatever it is. Um, but this is just some of the different ways that I have tried to track all of my information. And the main thing is because I'm tracking information across different kinds of crafts. They're all different. They're all very specific. Um, like I didn't show in here the spinning one, but I added all these fields in the spinning uh, table. Things like, did you spin this in the S direction or the Z direction? What was your twist angle? Um, you know, what was the wraps per inch for your singles? What's the wraps per inch for your applied yarn? How many plies is the yarn? All of these different things you can track. Um, and again, this idea that some things are related, some of these tables are related, but some of these tables are very, very separate. I don't need to know my spinning information in my weaving projects and vice versa. So that is basically it for today. It's very, very in-depth. I know it's not for everyone, but I'm curious to see if this is something that you might be interested in adopting or ideas that you might be interested in adopting. I would love to hear in the comments. You can let me know how you track all of your information because I'm constantly learning and looking at new ideas as well. Um, I know that ClickUp may not be for everyone because it's, you know, it's a very business oriented sort of system, um, but I already live in it. So it just made sense for me to do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say. So that is basically it for today. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, if you guys want to give this ClickUp a try, there's links there. And then if you want to give the template a try, you can also give that, uh, you can import that into your own ClickUp system and play around with it and see if you want to build other crafts into it, build other fields into it, whatever you want to do. So I encourage you guys to check this out. Thanks so much for being here. I guess I will see you guys next month in a couple of weeks. No, yeah, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to do another video about CSM knitting with my sock knitting machine. I Today is the last day of school before spring break, so it's crazy time. Um, and uh, yeah, just excited to come back and hang out with you guys. Thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to see you all here. I guess I'll see you guys in the next one. All right, bye for now.